environmental impacts, energy development, uh, but various aspects of, of energy. And the faculty often said they had no more research projects that they were working on. The faculty often said, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could get together, pull our resources, pull our expertise, so we could go after a larger project and a larger place. Uh, that discussion eventually led to the development of Uh, this is to help the community achieve consensus leading to sustainable environmentally sound public policy on energy issues facing northeastern Pennsylvania. And our approach, the way we're going to go about achieving that mission is through basic and applied research, subject to internal and external review, innovative education and public outreach, and providing the best information from our own research and the research of other people. So, sort of a quick timeline. Early in the summer of 2010, the Institute was it was in existence, the fact that we were talking about ways they can work together. Uh, a delegation from Welch went down to Washington, D.C. They met with uh, Vice President Biden and Energy, the Secretary of Energy, and Chu. And they talked about ideas that Wilkes had at the Institute, uh, talked about issues related to energy in the United States, uh, and also tried to identify different sources of funding. So a few months later, they came back with a response and they said, Department of Energy, National Energy Technology Laboratory, has some funds that might be available for you to do research. Uh, specifically, we're interested in doing research on Marcellus Shell. 2010, Marcellus Shell has from the boom started, so it was a pertinent issue. Uh, late in February 2011, the funding was finally authorized. We actually had staff on the board before the funding was actually authorized, but uh, that's when all that came into fruition. So, why ourselves? Why was NETL interested in ourselves? There's lots of unanswered questions. The big one being hydraulic fracturing. It's new to a lot of people. There's a lot of concern about the surface and the groundwater quality. Okay. People are worried about how that, how that technique is going to impact those. Uh, air pollution. Will Marcel Shell gas development create air pollution or add to existing air pollution problems? Uh, how about natural ecosystems? Is there going to be habitat fragmentation? Endangered species, that type of issues. Sociological and economic issues. What, what are the pros and cons of this development? Obviously, more money is going to come in, but what's the downside of that? Uh, we're seeing those issues specifically related to housing. Housing has become so expensive and so hard for people to get. Uh, you know, it's nice to have the, the drilling dollars come in, but people who live you know, in these areas have a lot of time getting housing sometimes. Uh, and then, specifically, hopefully, we're going to address tonight whether development activities uh, are they going to affect the public health? Are there going to be any impact? The other big reason for Marcel's is just the rapid development. It, in Pennsylvania, it just took off and it's just unbelievable how quick drilling started and how widespread it is. And then also with the citizens. If the citizens stood up to be very concerned, got organized very quickly. Uh, so all these issues need, need to be addressed. Uh, just a kind of graphic representation of how rapid the development is. This is, you know, sort of the exploratory phase or pre exploratory phase. These are all the wells that were drilled up to 2000, through 2008. And then 2009, got a little bit more intense. And then 2010, it really it almost doubled that year. And then we had almost another doubling again in 2011. So the development just took off extremely rapidly. Specifically, the contract we got, uh, this is, these are our, our tasks, what we're tasked with, is to evaluate uh, impacts on ourselves development on surface water quality, to develop a comprehensive community education program directed to multiple stakeholders. We're going to talk, not in real detail, but we'll talk a little bit about those two specifically. Uh, we also have a task to develop a, a GIS that's linked to a water quality database that will be accessible online and to the public. And we also have uh, some tasks to work with the Institute of Public Policy to develop policy analyses on various uh, government action regulations that have been uh, Personnel. Dr. Dale Bronson is actually the dean of the College of Science and Engineering. He's on vacation this week, so he could not be here. He is uh, also an associate director of the Institute. Dr. Klimo is the associate director of the Institute. He is recovering from surgery, so he could not be here tonight. I'm not sure which is worse for him. Not being here, but recovering from surgery. Uh, he's dying to be here. Uh, Dr. Tom Bernard, do you want to say that, Tom, real quick? Tom is our, our research scientist. He's, he's pretty much a water quality expert. Kimberly Larkin is our water quality technician. I'm Brian Albert. Uh, Eric Schramm's over here. He's our public outreach coordinator and our technical associate.
associate, he's in charge of the back of the program, how that works, the type of associate on that And then Courtney Sperger is our post back lawyer associate, and she informed me that that title means she does whatever we do on my classroom. Uh, we have some work study students working with us, uh, and they primarily they're assisting with the macro vertebrae program, which we'll talk about real quick. But they they collect the macro vertebrae to sort of make them identify. Uh, I'm gonna mess up these names, but I'm gonna try. Uh, Jessica Bonchesky is yeah, she's not here. Uh, Christy Johnson is in the back. Uh, Stephen Forney is in the front here, and Carrie Squaro. So, real quick, surface water quality, what are we doing? First thing we're doing is we're taking field measurements. Uh, we're using YSI saws, they measure a bunch of different parameters. Uh, we're doing routine, mostly routine sampling. We, we go out on the schedule and we, we take our samples. We are doing some opportunistic sampling. Uh, there was a inadvertent release from Horizontal Drilling on Manners Creek. We were able to go out in a somewhat timely fashion and do some opportunistic sampling really uh, inadvertently. We occasionally do short term. Sawn out in the stream, we'll leave it there for you know, one to seven days, let it collect data, and then we'll, we'll process the data. Now, we also have four sites where we do real time continuous sampling. These are uh, solar power, cellular phone connected sites. Uh, they collect 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and uh, we'll send the data back through a cell phone connection. Uh, lab analysis we take lab samples, we bring them back to our lab, and they get processed. We verify the parameters we measure in the field, and then we measure a bunch of additional parameters. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but if anybody has questions, we can talk about that later. Uh, macro vertebrate sampling. We're using something called the Pennsylvania TP semi quantitative method, and that's based on something called the EPA Rapid Bioassessment Protocol. Uh, it's just sort of the standard that you need to use if you do a macro sampling. We're looking primarily for the quantity, how many macros, and a macro vertebrate.
for the citizens, and hopefully get both sides to talk. How are we doing this? The first way we're trying to do this is through our website. This is where we have most of the essays, uh, you know, where we take the technical journal articles and stuff like that, and we create some essays that are easy to understand uh, and available for them that's easy to access. So that's our website, energy.books.edu. Uh, it started in January 2011. There's over 1,280 visitors each month. Uh, it's been visited by uh, 48 states and almost 100 different countries. And on that site, we also have a link to our real time and service work as well. We're also doing forums, such as this one. We're trying to do events where we draw people in so we can have relevant discussion uh, about the issues. We have one about last year, and that was a building consensus forum. We actually have a panel with various speakers from both pro, pro industry, anti industry, and academia. We're on the panel, they each presented a little thing, and then they had some panel discussion and some QA. Uh, we hosted the Pennsylvania House Democratic Policy Committee uh, in August last year, um, and basically the committee was looking for information about Marcel Shell. They wanted to know more, so they wanted to know what their, their citizens were concerned about, what their constituents were concerned about. Uh, and some of our staff members, in fact, provided testimony to that event. And then in November, we had an author, Stephen Smith, he broke into the country. Uh, he came in, he did a book and he did some answers, some question and answers. Which leads us in today, we're going to have the impacts of gastro on human animal health, and I usually don't like to, to read off people's biographies, I, I like to summarize them, but our speakers have extensive qualifications, so please bear with me when I want to read through this. Uh, Dr. Oswald received his PhD from Vanderbilt University in biochemistry, studying the effects of toxins on proteins in the central nervous system. He did postdoctoral studies as a muscular dystrophy and including college defense fellow at the Institute Pasteur in Paris before joining the faculty of Cornell University in 19. While on sabbatical leave from Cornell, he was a Fulbright Fellow at the University of Oxford from 1988 to 1989, and a Guggenheim Fellow at Harvard Medical School from 1994 to 1995. Dr. Oswald is currently a professor of molecular medicine in the Cornell College of Veterinary Medicine and a faculty fellow of the Atkinson Center for a Sustainable Future. His work on the effects of drugs and toxins on the structure and function of central nervous system proteins has been supported by the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and the is currently director of the Molecular Biophysics Training Program at Cornell. Dr. Oswald has served on numerous review panels for the National Institutes of Health and is on the editorial board of Molecular Pharmacology and the Journal of Biological Chemistry. Dr. Bamberger received her uh, doctorate of veterinary medicine from Cornell University in 1985. Before attending Cornell, she earned her master's degree in pharmacology uh, and worked in the quantum research for two years at New Bolton Center at the University of Pennsylvania. After graduating from Cornell, Dr. Bamberger studied at Oxford University and practiced small animal and exotic medicine and surgery in both Massachusetts and New York. Before opening up Meth Behavior Consultants in 2002, Dr. Bamberger returned to Cornell for training in the field of behavior medicine and after visiting fellow. She has a special interest in educating the public on veterinary topics. She has taught adult education courses and written two books on the topic of first aid. She devotes much of her spare time to documenting and studying the impacts of hydraulic therapy. Before we turn this over to the speakers, our, I told you our associate director was dying to be here tonight, so he has a statement that I have to read. Uh, so please bear with me again. As the associate director of Oaks Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, I'm happy to welcome you to this evening's presentation by Dr. Lambert Arnold. Because I am a company for surgery, I regret that I cannot do it. We are grateful to the time that I have to invite Dr.